All right, everybody, welcome back to Classical Christian Thought. <clears throat> Today we have Emmett O'Regan joining us. Hi, Hi, Emmett, how are you? Good, Eric. Thank you. All right, so this is uh, my first time meeting you, so uh, it's a yeah. pleasure. Um, can you uh, introduce yourself a little bit, and that way the, re the listeners know who, who you are? Okay, uh, yeah, my name's Emmett O'Regan. I'm a PhD student at Trinity College Dublin at the Loyola Institute. And the topic of my PhD thesis is on the indefectibility of the apostolic see. I'm trying to like look into like whether it's possible for a Pope to publicly teach heresy because of obviously the present scenario, um, which is quite unfortunate um but it is what it is sure um, sure yeah okay so um you know this topic has been a popular one now it's been a popular yeah. one for a long time right yes yeah, <laughs> yes yeah. but especially especially i think under the pontificate of john paul ii and benedict the 16th um it mm -hmm. wasn't as pressing Right. No. And then and then with with uh, with the pontificate of Pope Francis, we see mm -hmm. people resurrecting the question, looking into the mm -hmm. sources and and producing what they can to to contribute to the question. So um, you want to have a you have a PowerPoint. Is that correct? Yeah. Yeah. OK. Um, well, feel free. Feel free to. No. Yeah. So at the bottom yeah. there, if you see the word present, um. Let me see if uh, okay, see. Oh, yeah. does it does it come up present the word present and then share screen. Yep. Let's see present. Yep. Okay. And um, once you hit share screen, another window will come up, and you need to yep. select your PowerPoint window and then hit OK. Like your PowerPoint, okay. you should you should bring that into its own window so it's not you know with other things. Okay, let's see. Just trying to work it here. Um, That's okay. What do you see? Is it is it asking you uh, which window? It's yeah. It's saying. Uh, Microsoft Edge tab and then window. I'm looking at, I can see, uh, right, I can see it here. Yep. Should be able to do that now. It's, yeah, and it should, should come in. There we go. Yeah. I'll add it to the screen. There we go. And then, you know, if you want to just run through uh, your slides um, and, uh, yeah. you know, I think once you hit run slideshow, you could just hit your key, your space bar or whatever as you as you work through it so okay um just the topic that we're going to be talking about tonight is really to do with my article on vatican insider which was published in 2017 or and just that it was recently covered there by michael lofton on his uh reason and theology um podcast Mm -hmm. Um. So, <clears throat> I just wanted to just go over some of the things in it because there is some misunderstandings about this, especially uh, recently. Uh, Doctor Ed Fazer had wrote an article on Catholic World Report, um, just basically trying to say that my position was asserting that the ordinary papal magisterium is basically infallible, which is not the case at all. So it's not what I was trying to do argue at all. I, I didn't even think that was, uh, I think I tried to make that clear in the, the article itself. Um, but that just, yeah, I just want to concentrate on, let's see, um, the, the relatio of sure. the official relatio of, uh, the first Vatican Council, just like one of the claims in it was that St. Robert Bellarmine's opinion on a heretical Pope 
that God just would never allow for the possibility of a radical pope um, was going to be raised to the dignity of a dogma. Um, so that's quite a, it's a big claim, you know, because obviously that would fly in the face of uh, what the likes of Taylor Marshall and uh, various other people, um, even like, unfortunately, Bishop Strickland, who other ways, I think he's a, a brilliant bishop, but um, you know, it's like, <laughs> is the Pope actually capable of publicly teaching heresy? You know, it's, this is what Robert Bellarmine says was absolutely, it's not possible. Um, so <clears throat> um, just this is the book here um, that we're going to be looking at. It's in book form. The, the original was the Bellatio, uh, which Bishop Gosser read out before voting commenced on Pastor Eternus, so that the, the Council Fathers could ratify the content. Um, it, it's just basically an explanation of what they are actually going to vote on, so that they're crystal clear on what it is <coughs> that they're, they're voting on. Um, <clears throat> so this is just a Uh, an image of uh, Bishop Gosser himself. He was voted to be, or, or he was nominated to be the, the spokesperson for the deputation de fide, or de fide. <coughs> um, and the, the Bellatio was actually, it was a joint effort of the entire deputation uh, de fide. <coughs> um, and this is just the, the text in question that it's saying that these things are said about the opinion of Bellarmine. As far as the doctrine set forth in the draft goes, the deputation is unjustly accused of wanting to raise an extreme opinion, viz. that of Albert Pegasus to the dignity of a dogma. And then Gosser goes on to explain that the doctrine in the proposed chapter is not that of Albert Pegasus or the extreme opinion of any school, but rather it is the one and the same which Bellarmine teaches in the place cited by the Reverend Speaker and which Bellarmine adduces in the fourth place and calls most certain and assured, or rather correcting himself, the most common and certain opinion. Um, if I could, what, what's that quoting? What's that citation from? That's from um, Bishop Gosser's Relatio. Right. So it's, okay. Yeah. Uh, so it, it, it's there's quite a lot to unpack there, and it's 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 quite a, a difficult text. Um, I'm, I'm sure like that you'll have several questions to ask just about this one. And at, at, there's an ellipsis here, like I can't talk about, you know, what, there is stuff left out. I, I don't like adding ellipses because sometimes people do that to try and take things out of context. But sure. hopefully it, like that's just, I want to be able to, to try and set things as clear as possible um, because it's just, it's, it, it's open to so much misunderstanding and misinterpretation. Um, what is actually being said here? So, uh, just a few any questions you asked so far? Just no, you're good. Uh, it's been it's been a long time since I've read the Relatio. Um, mm -hmm. I've read uh, I read it quite a bit when I was preparing for my you know the manuscript for my own book on the papacy. Mm -hmm. um, I have a short section that uh, that makes re use of it, um, so I'm not very fresh on it. But um, yeah. no questions so far. I, I, everything so far is understood. Okay, well, that's good. Um, <clears throat> so just uh, just to recap, uh, just Bishop Gosser is saying here that there's a dispute on the floor about whether is Albert Pegasus' extreme opinion really going to be elevated to the, the dignity of a dogma here? And Bishop Gosser is saying no, it's not the opinion, the extreme opinion of Albert Pegasus. It's that of Bellarmine, which I mean, that's he 
he focuses down the uh, the fourth place in Bellarmine and the way he, he does he, he he singles out the exact hope which uh, I'll get to shortly. Um, so we can be exactly sure that it's it's Bellarmine's opinion, not Albert Pegasus. Um, just this is <clears throat> uh, Saint Robert Bellarmine, um, who was uh, made a, a doctor of the church in the early twentieth century. Um, he's widely considered to be uh, basically the main man uh, when it came to the, the First Vatican Council. It's it's been referred to multiple times as Bellarmine's council. Um, and Ignaz von Dollinger, um, the great historian um, who dissented to papal infallibility, so he really objected to the fact that they were the fathers of the First Vatican Council were about to, to raise one man's opinion to dogmatic status. And it, it's basically the other bit was a, a riff on that. One of the, the council fathers must have read Dollinger's book. Um, it were his numerous books, but Janus is probably throw it was his pseudonym who that, that was the pseudonym that he wrote under in order to like that was the, the major attack just before the, the council itself. Um and that was in the, the Pope and the Council. But um so he knew that what they were doing and he knew that they were basically going to elevate St. Robert Bellarmine's opinion on a heretical Pope to dogmatic status. And that's why as we'll see, it's he focused on the case of Pope Honorius um, as his major line of attack against the, the solemn definition of papal infallibility. Um, so <laughs> a lot of Catholics, like especially through uh, radical traditionists, kind of are focusing on this and set of the set of the in particular um, on this passage in um, the Romano Pontificia, Book Two. This is a, an earlier section of uh, the Romano Pontificia, uh, and where Bellarmine says, "Now the fifth true opinion is that if a pope who is a manifest heretic ceases in himself to be pope and head, just as he ceases in himself to be a Christian and member of the body of the church, whereby he be judged and punished by the church." Um, so obviously, like say, for instance, if Pope Francis taught heresy, then he's basically, it, it, if he's a manifest heret heretic, if he's condemned as a heretic by the church, then he automatically falls from the papacy. But there was, if, even if he's a formal heretic, then he stops being a heretic. It, it, it's, this has been dealt with multiple times by yourself and Michael Lofton before through it. I'm sure your your followers would uh, already know these distinctions between manifest, manifest heretic and formal heretic. Um, so, <clears throat> um, so I just want to look at the the opinion of Albert Pegues because this is the subject of confusion about. Um, what is actually being elevated to dogma in uh, what, what's being proposed to be elevated to dogma in the Relatio. And um, so this is from De Romano Pontificia, book two. It's Bellarmine again. So Bellarmine is trying to say that, yeah, it's there are five opinions on this matter. And this is just about the radical Pope. Um, so the first is that this is the first opinion. So we've seen the, the fifth opinion, but this is the the opinion of Albert Piggies, which is going to be brought back into the scene in book four of the, Ro the Romano Pontifice. Um, so it's just, we need to, to focus really on what Albert Piggies' opinion actually was, and it's just Bellarmine's sketching it out here for us. And he says, the first is of Albert Pegasus, who contends that the Pope cannot be a heretic and hence would not be deposed in any case, 
Such an opinion is probable and can easily be defended, as we will show in its proper place. Still, because it is not certain and the common opinion is to the contrary, it will be worthwhile to see what the response should be if the Pope could be a heretic. Um, so, basically, he's saying that the opinion of Albert Pegasus is easily defensible, but he'll go on to make a, a certain distinction which separates his opinion from Albert Pegasus, um, which he goes on to, to use as basically the major defense for papal infallibility. And it, he, the case for papal infallibility actually hinges on this, which is why Dollinger used the case of Pope Honorius as the, his major argument against the solemn de definition of papal infallibility. <clears throat> so I'll just go on to outline here Bellarmine's four opinions on papal teaching authority. So we're jumping across now. It's like most Sadovacantists will just they'll talk about um, Bellarmine's fifth opinion, right. all, which is asserted, asserted as the fifth true opinion. Right. But this is actually what Bellarmine's actual opinion was. Though he didn't believe that would ever happen. So this is just this is. Um, so he's 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 breaking it down now to four different opinions on papal teaching authority, and then he'll focus down on one. So you can see the the last two um, of these here is the third opinion was that of Albert Pegasus, and that's separated from his own opinion, which is the the fourth opinion, which. Bellarmine, he asserts, was commonly accepted by all Catholics. So the first opinion was that of a Pope should defend something, even as Pope, and even with a general council, it can be heretical in itself, and it can teach others heresy. The second opinion was that the Pope, even as Pope, can be a heretic and teach heresy if he defends something without a general council. So that's... Um, the, the opinion of the conciliars, so at the, right. at the time, and the the Gallicans, through it, so the, the after conciliarism was condemned, through the it continued in the form of Gallicanism. Um, the third opinion was that of Albert Pegasus, who believed that the Pope cannot in any way be a heretic, nor publicly teach heresy. So that's quite different from what Bellarmine's going to go on and assert. So the fourth opinion, which Bellarmine asserts, asserts was commonly accepted by all Catholics, was that whether the Pope can be a heretic or not, he cannot defend a heretical pro proposition which must be believed by the home church in any way. So that he's talking about papal infallibility to acts cathedral solemn definitions here. So, it's, so the fourth opinion is... So it's, it's separate just from his ordinary papal magisterium, but we'll see when he breaks it down, he'll make a distinction just between um, definitions and just the, the ordinary papal magisterium, even though it, it hasn't really been defined in that way yet. Though, but you can you can kind of see it's 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 starting to edge towards. Though it was only the the nineteenth century that we've seen these kind of distinctions being brought in through the the ordinary magisterium and the extraordinary magisterium. But at here he's, he's just he's referring to a Pope not being able to defend a heretical proposition. So it's this is where like some Catholics in the 19th century would have tried to say that Pope Honorius tried to formally defend the monophylite heresy. Um, but uh, Dollinger didn't do that because he knew that he didn't need to do that. All he had to do was to prove that, that he Pope, taught it, the, that he could teach it publicly. Right. So, and so if that he knew that St. Thomas Aquinas, at, who originally, through it's, he was the one who um, first fully explained the doctrine of papal infallibility um, before. Um, it, it, it hadn't been fully articulated, and so Bellarmine's just drawn out what St. Thomas Aquinas actually taught, 
Um, so, <clears throat> um, so it's what St. Thomas Aquinas based it on was that a Pope would never be able to, to teach heresy to the universal church because the universal church can never err. So that, that he, he used that as his, his primary basis. And this is what Bellarmine goes on to do as well. So just to just to keep uh, just to ask a clarifying question, um, because you know some of these distinctions that we employ today, um, well, they were obviously uh, absent in a lot yeah. of the thinkers of the nineteenth mm -hmm. century. So that mm -hmm. fourth opinion of Bellarmine is basically saying, any time the Pope and uh, uh, when he writes a doctrine um, or teaches to the universal mm -hmm. church in mm -hmm. his ordinary magisterium. Um, that was all the criterion that was needed for the impossibility or the incapacitance for heretical promulgation. Yeah, well, it's Bellarmine, he, he, he bases his case for papal infallibility on whether a pope can publicly teach heresy. He doesn't like. He doesn't base it on just that he, he'll only be protected against heresy in formal acts, cathedra, right? Yeah, he, assassins, yeah. No, it's it's my understanding that um, mm -hmm. that uh, you know he 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 posited various arguments. It's never been the case, so therefore a pope mm -hmm. can't be a formal heretic. That doesn't mm -hmm. require him to to actually enact an authentic teaching action it just it's not possible for him to even be um a formal hair to add form and material together to yeah make, yeah make it, 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 it will come to that and it a bit just it he allows for the possibility bellarmine allows for the possibility of a pope uh privately teaching heresy and that's different from piggies piggies what it says that a pope could never even privately teach heresy so that's the 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 major sure like so like say pope francis on a, an airplane um can he privately teach heresy yes that's what bellarmine would say um Pegasus would say no that the pope would even be protected against heresy in that capacity which is obviously very extreme right. and uh, ridiculous um but so it's just this is the the fourth opinion just where um Bellarmine goes on to kind of unpack uh just uh each of through it what's contained in these four opinions and from these four opinions the first is heretical the second is not properly heretical for we see that some who follow this opinion are tolerated by the church, even though it seems all to gather erroneous and proximate to heresy. This is because at the time, um, Gallicanism still hadn't been formally condemned. Um, so he's writing just before um, it was the, the four Gallican articles were formally condemned. So that, that's when they became uh, actually proximate to heresy and then with the solemn definition or, or with <clears throat> um, the first canon in post Turnus, it, it becomes then formal heresy. So um, there's like a, th there's different grades through that. There's a evolution of through it's where um, it becomes proximate to heresy. And then once something's raised, the, via a solemn decree through or like by anathema then it becomes heresy so and then he's talking about the third opinion it's which is albert pegasus it's he, he says it's probable though it was still not certain which is absolutely like it like albert pegasus even admitted himself that his opinion was like it, it, it went against everybody else's through because it, it was so extreme. And then he goes on to say that the fourth is very certain and must be asserted. And we will state a few propositions 
so that it can be understood and confirmed more easily. <clears throat> uh, so it, this is basically Robert Bellarmine's major argument, and it, it was St. Thomas Aquinas's as well, through which he's just drawn out what St. Thomas Aquinas taught. So it's Bellarmine believed that the indefectible nature of the universal church precluded the possibility of it being led into doctrinal error by a pope who publicly taught heresy. And this is just one of the um, quotes that I think summarizes his position uh, pretty well, which is the pope is the teacher and shepherd of the whole church. Thus, the whole church is so bound to hear and follow him that if he would err, the whole church would err. So this is basically what um, the doctrine of papal infallibility is founded on. So, <clears throat> um, so the defend the fourth opinion. So it, this is where it starts to get a bit confusing. Um, through because it's you've got four opinions and now four propositions, but it, you need to be able to to separate these four propositions out from the four opinions because the four opinions through it is included like um albert pegasus is the third opinion and dollar is the fourth opinion and now we're coming to the Bellarmine is putting forth four propositions in defense of the fourth opinion which is separate from pegasus so the first of these four propositions is the Pope can never err when he teaches that the whole church and matters concerning the Catholic faith. So this is just through, so again, this is not, there's no distinction between extraordinary magisterium and ordinary magisterium. It's just the Pope's public magisterium at this point. So it's like, um, Bellarmine isn't making these distinctions that will later come into play. Uh, the second is that not only the Roman pontiff cannot err in faith, but even the particular Roman church cannot err. So this is just, it's again, the, the whole indefectibility of the, um, the universal church. When they say the Roman church, they mean the universal church, really, um, the Latin West. Um, so not only, so the third proposition is not only can the Supreme Pontiff not err in decrees of faith, but even in precepts of morals, which are prescribed for the whole church. So this is just basically the same argument, only just being applied to morals. So it's just faith and morals, which is the, the limits of infallibility. <clears throat> and then the fourth proposition, which is what Bishop Gosser, um, through on behalf of the deputation of the feed, says was going to be raised to the, the dignity of a dogma, was that it can be believed probably and piously that the supreme pontiff is not only able to err as pontiff. Now that's important to take into consideration here, because that's completely different from what Albert Pegasus is saying. Um, but even that as a particular person, he is not able to be heretical by pertinaciously believing something contrary to the faith. Um, so if you if you could afford a question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Keep, <clears throat> keep, keep going. Yeah, because yeah. yeah, it's it's important to keep the questions coming. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. This is um you know, it's like uh, when you first get introduced to these concepts, it, it almost seems simple. But then yeah, you, when you dig and dig and <laughs> dig and read the history yeah. and you realize that people at different eras were thinking differently than the way we're thinking today. Yeah. Th now it's like you're walking on a minefield. Right. Yeah. But so this first site quotation there up uh, on there, um, you're saying that this um that 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 opinion that the pope could never be a uh a formal heretic in his own person um yeah, what, what, that one what, right there sorry yeah that one is oh, being the, elevated the to a dogma? Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah. So, but that this is it's separated out here. So it's what he's saying is that the, it, he'll come on to argue like two different cases why that would be. So, <clears throat> um, so what he's saying is that Christ's prayer for Peter's faith would prevent him from being a, a formal heretic and thus losing the faith. So it's that. Um, but it's what Albert Pegasus also held that, but Albert Pegasus' position was a bit different in that Albert Pegasus didn't allow for the possibility of a Pope privately teaching heresy. So like say, in just as like private sermons, just after um, daily mass, say where he's not, trying to teach to the universal church he's just he's he's given a riff uh -huh. just on whatever's coming off the top of his head at that particular moment so it's that's the pope as a private theologian though it's the, the pope has no protection in that way it's only when he goes to teach something in his capacity as teacher as the universal church so that it's not even as like say as the the local bishop of rome so we could teach something uh, as the the local bishop of rome which would be potentially heretical um this is bellamy the uh, biggest uh no no this is a uh, uh bellarmine yeah it, it's bellarmine it it doesn't make those kind of distinctions, but this is this is brought in later. This is um, but Bellarmine, he allows for the possibility that a, a pope can privately teach heresy, and Pegasus doesn't. He he would say that, um, like it's it's as we'll see through the the case of Pope John the twenty second, kind of eliminates Pegasus um position completely because Pope John the twenty second privately taught heresy well not obstinately so it's like it's before it was it's like an innocent um, it's an innocent heretical yeah, promulgation. yeah it was it was material heresy so but he he, he still um he, he taught it in his capacity as a um a private theologian so but Pegasus would have said that wouldn't have been possible you know? so, yeah so so and you you would say that um that Bishop Gasser um, mm -hmm. it, it believed that what he was arguing is mm -hmm. that um, the Pope cannot be a formal heretic mm -hmm. is a dogmatic teaching. Well, it's he thought that this was going to be raised to the, the dignity of a dogma through in, something in, that was contained in popular terms. Uh, okay. So, um, it, it, and it's not very clear in a pastor attorney's sure how this would actually come about but it, it's um it's and, and just oh. to be clear um just to be clear um mm -hmm. some somebody who thinks that the pope can be a somebody who thinks that the pope cannot be a formal heretic mm -hmm. can can still say that can still believe that the Pope could promulgate heretical propositions in his mm -hmm. ordinary magisterium, just in a way that's innocent of form and material. Together. No, no. I think what Gosser is saying that it would be impossible for a Pope to publicly teach heresy. This is what Bellarmine taught. So it's, it's what Bellarmine taught was just that the Pope would never be able to teach heresy publicly right. because the whole church is so bound to listen to the Pope in his public capacity as shepherd of the universal church that if he publicly taught heresy, then the entire church would be Goes led into heresy yeah. and then the entire church will fail. Right. So that's what he said was going to be raised to dogmatic still. Um, but what, what I'm saying is some somebody mm -hmm. just aside from what, um, aside from what uh, uh, Bishop Gasser said, mm -hmm. in theory, in theory, mm -hmm. somebody could hold to the view that the Pope can never be a formal heretic. 
while also mm -hmm. believing that he could be a hered he could promulgate heretical propositions in his ordinary magisterium mm -hmm. but as soon as he gets corrected and is shown that he's going against the faith of the church and he mm -hmm. he immediately takes it back that would save him from being a formal heretic right mm -hmm. it's it, it's not really what Gasser is saying through it. You have to take sure, it. Yeah, I, I, I know. Yeah, Gasser yeah. is not saying that, but what I'm saying in mm -hmm. theory, somebody could, mm -hmm. I mean, just, just so we have our distinctions down, you mm -hmm. know, some, somebody being a formal heretic in mm -hmm. their private person in the papal office, mm -hmm. um, that's not necessary. That doesn't necessarily protect him from mm -hmm. teaching heresy in his ordinary magisterium because. Oh formal heresy formal heresy goes beyond it it, it goes it, in other words you have to have that obstinate formality yeah, mm, yeah to, i think i know what you're saying yeah um i understand that's not what gasser is saying yeah yeah it's what what, what gasser is saying is just basically that um the the pope and his ordinary magisterium wouldn't be able to teach heresy because Catholics are even bound to a certain degree, um, not the, the full ascent of like divine and Catholic faith, but through it, like even then there were no, it was known that if the Pope and his public teachings through that, the, they were bound in a certain capacity through the, the following. Um, so it's what basically the argument in which um, St. John Henry Newman would later go on to employ was that it, if it was possible for um, a Pope to do this, then there would have been doctrinal corruption entering into, um, like, even at the, the level of ordinary universal magisterium. So the life of the church, it could have, like, why it's St. John Henry Newman, it's he fought off the case of uh, monophysitism and um, he began to see himself in that kind of light as an Anglican. And he, he, he just, he began to see that it, it, it was possible that what am I a monophysite through it's in, am I comparable to the monophysite? And that's what led to his journey to the Catholic faith through it's because he began to see that God just w wouldn't allow this kind of doctrinal corruption to, to enter into the church. Um, so the God would always protect the church against this. But like uh, Newman himself, he kind of tended towards the idea that, um, that the Pope was only protected against heresy and infallible solemn definitions. Which is where we get to the the problem today is where uh, there is a confusion today that where a lot of Catholics think that the Pope is only protected against heresy from teaching heresy in the extraordinary magisterium, um, but that's not the case. This isn't what's being proposed by the First Vatican Council. It's not what Bishop Gosser is saying, and he is teaching this to the. The bishops are, are he's explaining this in clear terms to the bishops before they take their vote they know that the entire case hinges on whether a pope can publicly teach heresy because if a pope can publicly teach heresy then he could potentially defend a radical proposition to be believed by the entire church so this is where it's the papal infallibility rests on this as this is what was understood back then in the, the 19th century. Is that clear? Or? Um, yeah, I mean, I, you know, I personally, you know, my personal, um, let, let, me, let me just tell you a little bit about my personal view here, um, mm -hmm. is that when I read the historical sources uh, in the first millennium, mm -hmm. it, it does appear as though nobody is working with distinctions of ex cathedra or no. non ex cathedra. No. Um, this is why Dollinger kind of latched onto this 
throw it. He, he says that there, there was no papal infallibility in the first millennium. And a, a, a senior um, podcast with Gavin Ortlin. And the, <clears throat> um, to a certain extent, they're correct in that all these distinctions weren't brought in until St. Thomas Aquinas. It was St. Thomas Aquinas who was the one that was able to show that the Pope alone was able to make uh, an addition to the creed, for example, so, so which is right. absolutely infallible. Um, so it, it's really not until St. Thomas Aquinas that you get this distinction where the Pope acting alone outside of an ecumenical council was able to define infallible um, propositions which must be believed by the entire church. Um, so, sorry, that's just... A, no, that's okay. That's okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, you know, I wrote I wrote a whole book on um, on the issue of the papacy in the first millennium. and Yeah, um, I've, I've started to read through it. Just, at, is there any word in the UK and Ireland where um, you can buy the, the paper edition? I, I can only get the the Kindle. If you if you if you if you order it at St. Paul Center, the actual yeah. publisher, you, it ships yeah. anywhere in the world. Yeah, it's brilliant. It's just the amount of work that you've put into this is just it's amazing, Harry. It's just <laughs> it, it's just it's incredible. Yeah. Oh, 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 thank you. I, I thank you. I mean, I um if if you order it on Amazon, I don't think it ships mm -hmm. everywhere in the world, but if you if you order mm -hmm. it from the, the publisher, uh yeah. it ships, you know. Brilliant. It's just it, it's so much better to have the the paper in front oh, of yes. you. Oh yes. Oh yeah. yeah. Yeah, I can't I can't ever do Kindle. I I, I yeah. can never do Kindle. Um but my, my my in my view of uh you know the first millennium sources it mm -hmm. uh there are there are two views, you know, mm -hmm. there mm -hmm. there are, there's the view that the pope can never teach heresy. Mm -hmm. Um and that seems to be defended quite strongly by a number mm -hmm. of popes um mm -hmm. ma you know a number of significant church fathers and yeah. uh specifically like the letter of pope agatho to the sixth yeah. ecumenical council um yeah. he's not making di distinctions at all no. you know, he's he's he makes reference to his predecessors yeah. you know he's mm -hmm. the little he's the most li the most little of mm -hmm. all of them so mm -hmm. he he's talking about all of his predecessors um having been uh the object of the promise you know uh mm -hmm. that their faith will not fail so mm -hmm. and and then he refers to all the constitutions written yeah. by the apostolic see mm -hmm. um on the other hand uh you know so I, th so that's one position that the roman see will never you know the the roman pontiff the roman mm -hmm. church will never err right um, but then yeah, there's the yeah. then there's the view that the Pope can err, it can teach yeah, heresy, yeah. and 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 yeah. that that view is they don't they also don't make distinctions between material <laughs> and formal. No. So no. it's it's yeah. just it's really just yeah. he can be a heretic and yeah. teach it, or he yeah. cannot. Yeah. And yeah. Um, we have had to build more distinctions. Yeah. Um, yeah. Based on that, but at the current moment, um, mm -hmm. I think that uh, given what happened at the Council of Constantinople 681, mm -hmm. uh, given what happened at the uh, the next few councils, the Council of Nicaea and mm -hmm. the Council of Constantinople, Constantinople 869, um, in light of that, the last thing we've ever heard on Honorius, you mm -hmm. know, Pope Honorius from the from the papal throne yeah. is is that he was a heretic. Mm -hmm. Um now I I it's very difficult for me to believe that Honorius was teaching monothelitism. We won't get into that. Uh I yeah, when, yeah. when I read that letter of his it seems like it's it's a I believe Maximus the confessor Pope John the yeah, Fourth yeah. And it, it's very time. clear from the text. It, I think yeah. at the time, the the um, Byzantine emperors, they didn't want this kind of outside interference from Rome. So they were starting to, they, they wanted to say, yes, 
the the Roman Pontiff can teach heresy. But we we don't want this kind of outside influence. No. Um, it's even for a while through the the popes were under the Byzantine influence, but especially when uh, you didn't have the Byzantine papacy anymore. That's when you you start to get uh, like Photius right. accusing the, the Pope of teaching actual heresy through um, a living Pope, n- not just a deceased Pope. So, right. Well, I, let let you know. You let's go move on with your presentation. I don't want to get side too sidetracked, but um, <laughs> if you if you want to go on to the next uh, slide, feel feel free. Yeah, yeah. feel free. Okay, that's right. Um, <clears throat> so it's just these are the differences between Bellarmine's fourth proposition and Pace's third opinion. So this is again through what there's a lot of confusion between these. Um, so at Bishop Gosser, he kind of outlines it here very clearly the opinion of Albert Pegasus, which Bellarmine indeed calls pass and probable was that the Pope as an individual person or a private teacher was able to err from a type of ignorance, but was never able to fall into heresy or teach heresy. So that's really important to take note of because Albert Pegasus, he just doesn't allow for um, a Pope teaching heresy as a private teacher. So say for, example um pope benedict the 16th and his jesus of nazareth right um series of books that albert pegasus would say that he, he wouldn't be able to teach heresy even in that capacity whereas Bellarmine says that the supreme pontiff is not able to err as pontiff so when Bellarmine saying to err he means not just like just make mistakes he's he's, he's talking about heresy that's right. like error to the creative, um, the, the theological note of heresy. So, <clears throat> um, so yeah, and then um, this is just Bellarmine's fourth proposition now, which is different from um, Pegasus, just it's how to separate the, the two. It's while there's a certain amount of confusion as to how to differentiate Pegasus' position. From Ballard Man's view, the key difference is that Pigas held that the Pope could not be a heretic in any way, non passe ulu modu esse hereticu, while Ballard Man allowed for the possibility that the Pope could teach heresy as a private doctor, but not in his capacity qua Roman pontiff. <clears throat> and that, that leads is again to the case of we've, we've already covered this um pope john the 22nd who did teach her well not formal heresy because it hadn't been defined but he something that was material materially heretical um at even before it had been defined um so piggies wouldn't have um it, it's just his opinion i think it's it just it's it, it's totally negated by um the case of pope john the 22nd and also through it's it's just it's crazy that it's, it's it's like saying that the pope is always an oracle that everything that falls out of the pope's mouth is going to be binding that that's not the case through the pope even in the ordinary magisterium can make mistakes through its that's why the ordinary magisterium is reversible, though it's not like it's, there, there can't be errors in it. Just what Robert Bellarmine would say that that these errors cannot reach the the theological note of heresy. Um, so <clears throat> it's Bellarmine offers two proofs in support of the fourth proposition, um, which again is the fourth proposition is what Gosser says was going to be raised to the, the dignity of a dogma. Um, he says the first proof, it is proved one because it, it seems to require the sweet disposition 
of the providence of God. For the Pope not only should not, but cannot preach heresy, but rather should always preach the truth. He will certainly do that since the Lord commanded him to confirm his brethren. And for that reason added, I have prayed for thee that thy fail, faith shall not fail. That is, at least the preaching of the true faith shall not fail in thy throne. So again, he's making those distinctions that it's, it, it's in his capacity as a teacher of the universal church. So it's as Pope. And then the second proof, which he'll go on to offer, he'll devote a very long uh, section to, um, is the proof ab eventu, which is from the event itself. It is proved ab eventu for this, to this point, no pontiff has been a heretic, or certainly it cannot be proven that any of them were heretics. Therefore, it is a saying that such a thing cannot be. So he, he then goes on to devote um, the next several chapters of uh, the Romano Pontificia defending this position, which includes defending against um, just any Pope in history who's ever been accused of teaching heresy. Um, so, it, and in particular, Pope Honorius, and the, that's where Dollinger really latches on to because Pope Honorius was condemned by uh, the Sixth Ac Ecumenical Council. So, and then, uh, just this, this is again, this is just some of the reasons where um, Bellarmine outlines why uh, a Pope cannot teach heresy. It is gathered correctly that the Pope by his own nature can fall into heresy but not when we posit the singular assistance of God, which Christ asked for him by his prayer. So he's even saying that a, a Pope couldn't be, not knowingly, he couldn't absolutely believe a heresy and continue to believe in that. He, he thinks that even in that capacity, um, that a Pope wouldn't be able to fall into heresy. Um, and then he just, again, he just, he, he keeps, this is the, the major proof text, it's Luke 22, um, 32, is that um, same and same, behold, Satan demanded to have you, that he might sift you like wheat, but I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail. So that, this is basically, this is what the, the papal claims are based on. <clears throat> so Bellarmine goes on to assert that because of this prayer, Christ had given two unique privileges to the, the Roman pontiffs. And the first is that one, that he could not ever lose the true faith in so far as he was tempted by the devil. And that is something more than the gift of perseverance. For he said to persevere even to the end, which although he fell in the meantime, he still rose again in the end and was discovered faithful since the Lord prayed for Peter that he could not ever fall because he held fast to the faith. The second privilege is that he, as the Pope, could not teach something against the faith or that there would never be found one in his see who would teach against the true faith. <clears throat> And then it just this ties back into um, Bishop Gosser's relatio. So it's in the relatio itself, through Bishop Gosser, he, he goes on to say that uh, basically he researched Bellarmine's argument, which is that no Pope has ever taught heresy um, in his public capacity as Pope. So it's just, I'll, I'll read the, the quote here again. It's as far as the Council of Constantinople IV is concerned, the words adduced in the proposed chapter are almost identical with the formula of Pope Hermistus, by which the Asian schism was resolved and which was approved not only by the Church of the West, but also by a very large part of the Eastern Church. It was said that this formula contains nothing more than the confidence 
that it would never happen to the Shore of Peter, what had already regretfully happened to so many other apostolic sees, and that the successors of the Prince of the Apostles would function until the end of the world in the task of protecting the faith and of confirming their brothers. <clears throat> so then, um, just going back, this is based on Bellarmine again, because obviously what the, um, the council fathers were, they knew that it, it was Bellarmine's argument that was going to be basically um, elevated the dogmatic status. Um, so <clears throat> um, this is just where Bellarmine outlines basically what the Bellatio is was claiming there that this is what the, the Bellatio is basing that statement on. It's um, fifthly, it is proven from experience and in that twofold. For in the first place, it is certain that all patriarchal sees so fell from the faith that heretics sat in them teaching others their heresy with the exception of the Roman see. The heresarchs Macedonius, Nestorius, and Sergius sat in the Sea of Constantinople. The Urians, Georgius, and Lucius, along with Dioscorus, the Monophysite, Sirius, the Monophylite, and many others sat in Alexandria. At Antioch, there was Paul of Samosata, Peter Nathius, the Monophysite, Macarius, the Monophylite, and others. John, the follower of Origen, and before him, Eutychus, Ernius, and Her Hurley the Urian sat in Jerusalem. And that's um, so it's Bellarmine's just trying to say that, okay, this it's happened in many instances in other patriarchal seas, but it never ever happened in the Roman Sea. And that it's it's pretty astonishing that if, if no pope was ever a heretic then you, you, you do have to to think that that is that that's pretty incredible if just given the amount of instances that other um patriarchal sees had given birth to heresies um so this is just again just another instance where um um, Bellarmine is saying that the Roman church has always been impervious to heresy. So no such thing can be shown from the Roman church, from which it appears that the Lord truly prayed for it lest its faith would fail. For this reason, Rufinius states in his exposition of the creed, in the church of the city of Rome, no heresy ever had its beginning, and there the ancient custom is preserved. The second thing is which experience shows is that the Roman pontiff has condemned a great many heresies without a general council, namely, namely that of Pelagius, Priscilla, Jovian, Vigilanius, and many others, whom the whole church has held as true heretics and shuddered at them, simply because the Roman church has condemned them. Therefore, it is a saying that the whole church believes that the Roman pontiff cannot err in matters of this sort. Um, just again, we've, we've already talked about Pope and Orient, so um, I don't think we need to go into any detail about that. Just um, other than um, Bellarmine's, uh, his case for um, defending Pope uh, Honorius, it was basically, it, it was accepted at the First Vatican Council. There was um, Father Paul Batala. Um, he had written a detailed response to both Dallinger and um, many others just before the, the, at the eve of the First Vatican Council. And he had resurrected this argument of Bellarmine. Um, just that, um, just, I'll read out Bellarmine's words here. Then they say, however, that a little blow, he clearly preaches only one will in these words, which is Pope Honorius. Um, he did he did say about one will. Um, Wherefore, we profess one will of our Lord Jesus Christ, 
I respond, in that place, Honorius spoke only on the human nature and meant that in the man Christ, there were not two wills opposing, opposing each other, one of the flesh and the other of the spirit, but only one, namely the spirit. For the flesh in Christ desired absolutely nothing against reason. So it's just basically the, the basic response against this um, accusation against Pope Honorius was that though did Honorius assert through that Christ only had one divine will, but Pope Honorius, he goes on to mention that his human will couldn't conflict with his divine will because th that his human nature hadn't been corrupted um, by original sin. So it's, he wasn't aware at the time, nobody, monophilism wasn't a thing. It was only just monoenergism, which is different. So his words were then later twisted into monophiletism. Um, it's just very unfortunate um, just that he did say one will, but by saying one will, he just meant that his, his human will would never conflict with his divine will, not that he didn't possess both wills. Um, and just, yeah, again, it's just that Ignaz von Dollinger latched on to that case in particular because it was the most pretty clear to him um, of a, a pope publicly teaching heresy, and he, he didn't even he, he didn't try and argue that um, Pope Honorius actually tried to defend this to be held by the whole church. He just um, tried to show that he publicly taught this as a heresy, and for Dallinger, he thought that that totally undermined the case for papal infallibility. Um, but another of the um, the, the main theologians before the First Vatican Council who did um, accept the case of Pope Honorius as like a critically undermining the solemn definition of papal infallibility was uh, Bishop Carl Joseph von Heffel. Um, and he was one of the, like, he was alongside Dollinger um, just for the, the death of his historical research. Um, and even though before he had written extensively um, saying that Pope Honorius had taught the, the monophyte heresy, he retracts this after the um, the solemn definition because he, he knew that basically this wasn't compatible. Through it, you, you can't say that the Pope can publicly teach heresy and then accept the doctrine of papal infallibility. It because of this, then he goes on to revise um, his previous public statements, and you can find that just in the, the history of the councils of the church. Um, and and he goes on to reconfirm Father Paul um, Batalis kiss. Um, yeah, and, and just yeah, it's just Ballermain again. Just says that the. Church councils are able to err in that respect, so that they can err in matters of particular fact, through in condemnations. Through it's, you can't use a, a church council or a pope, even acting with the church council, cannot possibly teach on something that isn't directly related to the deposit of faith. So it's if it's separated from the deposit of faith, through it's. On a matter of particular fact, then um, it, it, it's outside the, uh, the bounds of infallible teaching. Um, and this is just that Bellarmine just states the, the view of Juan um, de Torquemada, who teaches that the fathers of the Sixth Council condemned Tenorius, but from false information, and hence erred in that judgment. Although a legitimate general council could not err in defining dogmas of faith, and the Sixth Council, council did not, still it could err in questions of fact. So th this was just already really generally acknowledged. Um, just And this is Bellarmine even 
uh, shows that this was the, the common consensus of both Catholic and Protestant theologians at that time in the 16th century. With these things being loaded, all Catholics and the heretics agree on two things. Firstly, that the pontiff, even as pontiff, can err in particular controversies of fact, even together with the general council, because these depend expressly on the testimonies of men. And then secondly, the Pope can err as a private teacher from ignorant, even in universal questions of law, concerning both faith and morals, just as what happens to other teachers. So, um, yeah, just again, just if the Pope isn't acting in that kind of capacity, then he, he doesn't have any protection. Um, but that that's kind of that that's the end of the presentation that I prepared for. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, that's a good that's that's a good place to end. Uh, so I have a yeah. couple questions. Um, yeah. So uh, you know, somebody noted there. Uh, you know, Juan Torquemada noted that a council cannot err in dogmas of faith, but on questions of fact. But mm -hmm. one of the things I'm curious about is what happens if you have a number of ecumenical councils that mm -hmm. err on the identification of a pope as a heretic? For example, mm -hmm. the Council of Constantinople 681 um, it uh, it 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 condemned Honorius as a heretic, and mm -hmm. then the next the next uh, two councils, um, mm -hmm. well, really, yeah, it's the next two councils uh, reiterate that condemnation, mm -hmm. and and in one of those councils, uh, Pope uh, Hadrian the um, second mm -hmm. even you know he even specified that Honorius was was a heretic now mm -hmm. could uh could it be it could a council error in fact mm -hmm. if it's so associated to the question of whether a pope could be a her teach heresy or not heres you see what i'm saying like there's a there's a there's a fact there mm -hmm. about the letter of honorius or the two letters to sergius right mm -hmm. but the it's it's so it's consubstantial with with the material mm. of a pope teaching heresy yeah. cool. so it would seem as though it would seem as though or you know I'm, I'm, maybe somebody in the audience might be asking um if if a council were to condemn a pope's uh writings by mistake mm -hmm. right by yeah. false information so, would wouldn't it still be wouldn't it still be also uh, nudging on the question of the Pope being able to teach heresy. See what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So this came up later. Um, so the Jansenists used Bellarmine's distinctions on whether, like, could a, a Pope um, err in matters of particular fact? And they took that to the extreme and said right. that, uh, well, it, it, it's it's a matter of fact we'll through it whether um Cornelius Johnson actually taught heresy and those five, therefore, the five those propositions. Those, yeah. Um yeah so it's it's the secondary object of infallibility. Um so what will later come into play is that it, it has it, it's what they argued was that it, it has to be the Pope and general councils can only define uh, solemn definitions and on the the positive faith. So the, it has to have the the positive faith as its object. Um, so outside of that, general councils and popes they, they don't have that authority. They're not. Um, like a an oracle that, that can't determine individual guilt of individual people outside of the apostolic age through it's it's beyond the remit um it's the like it's it, it, you can't get a ecumenical council to decide or to, to determine 
um, like um, civil law cases, say just they, they don't have that authority. Um, so like if, if somebody's actually guilty of a crime or it's just it's it's beyond it's it's not associated with the the deposit of faith so it's like if pope honorius was guilty of heresy absently um how, how can they determine that from the deposit of faith there was there's a right. huge separation right. there so it's, right but hmm. but let's say uh so that makes perfect sense but yeah. but it, but if a council were to collect the public writings of a pope mm -hmm. and let's say they they said um well we're not going to judge the person of the pope you know mm -hmm. um but we are going to say that what he wrote mm -hmm. was heretical right yeah. and that yeah. and if they do it based yeah. off false mm -hmm. information and let's mm -hmm. say they do it based off they, they do it erroneously they they mm -hmm. you know it's based off of a false reading Mm -hmm. false information whatever it is mm -hmm. um would not that decision by a council to condemn papal writings mm -hmm. uh consubstantially touch the deposit of faith material on whether a pope could teach heresy or not mm -hmm. do you see what I'm, do you, i don't know if my question yeah, it's um to it has the authority to, to teach on faith and morals based on the, the positive faith. So it, it can formally uh, determine that uh, the monophyte heresy is actually heresy. Um, but it cannot like definitively say that Pope Honorius in his subjective conscious actually subscribed to this heresy and don't to an extent that it was obstinate where he fell from the faith through it just it's not that that's encroaching into <laughs> judging somebody's sure. subjective chances through it's not um through based on it, it's just separate totally what they can't do is say that uh in the gospels uh christ um had prayed through it. it it said that not my will be done but thy will be done through so that is within the teaching remit of the church it, it, it's based on sacred scripture so that they can say definitively that um it's that is within the remit the remit isn't on particular historical facts outside of um the, the positive faith if you know right what I mean. right right yeah but so it's very clear it's it's very clear to me that the that the council cannot infallibly um yeah. you know say that pope honorius fulfilled the material and form condition for heresy yeah. Well, the man was dead for 40 years yeah. i mean they had no chance to defend himself you know yeah. um but but my question is, and this is something I've been working on in my own studies, yeah. is um, can the council, when the council <clears throat> condemns <throat> Honorius's letters, right? <clears throat> that's different than condemning Honorius, right? Yeah. So yeah. Just, just, just the two letters of Honorius. Yeah. The, the could contend the content as interpreted um, by through its. And that's what they were condemning. And they've got the authority to condemn the content, but they can't say for definite that, oh, this is Pope and Orse's intent. So because you had the various witnesses at the time, um, through like uh, St. Maximus the Confessor, um, Pope John the Fourth, sure. and sure. yeah, even his personal secretary, um, Abbot John, through it's they all witnessed to no, this isn't what Pope Honorius meant at all. It, it, this, he didn't, because at the time, there, there was no such thing as, uh, it, it wasn't even an issue. What, like, did Christ have won the fame will? Um, it was only, it, they took his words out of context and then they, they tried to say that, well, 
so they abandoned the mono energism debate and then they latched on to the right. one will argument so but at the time that wasn't an issue and pope and Horace didn't even it, it wasn't on his radar at all through it so it, he was kind of tricked into it tricked oh yeah into, yeah yeah uh, there's there's no uh, doubt in my mind yeah. that that's what mm -hmm. happened but but from the from the standpoint of the council mm -hmm. which examined his writings mm -hmm. um they they saw those writings yeah. Yeah. as composed yeah in error that it contained mm -hmm. it contained mm -hmm. the error um the material yeah of, yeah. of error mm -hmm. yeah. um now if they condemn those writings um aren't they touching on the faith question of whether a pope could teach heresy mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do, yeah. do you see what yeah. i'm saying, trying to he, say at, at the time there was like <laughs> there, there was distinctions starting to be made between the apostolic see and individual popes so what through it i think from pope leo just from memory I had made a distinction between the the pope as pope and the pope as particular person through as like the it's the the cds and the sedans right. so you have to make these distinctions and it, and then between yeah the, the pope as a particular person and the pope as a, a public teacher Efficiency. and i think the the might have been making some of these distinctions even back then although i, I can't prove that through it, it, it it's yeah i know what you mean at, at, I, I wish they thought about these things more. <laughs> make much, it make things much easier for yeah. us nowadays. We we have somebody who asked a question here. I don't know if you could see it yeah. on the screen. Um, he asked, mm -hmm. how, and this is for you, um, Emmett. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. How how exactly does this not make the Pope infallible in his ordinary magisterium, or did he, yeah. or did I misunderstand before? Yeah, because it, that's never been like it's. So uh, just again, the Pope in his ordinary magisterium can err in particular fact. He can err in throw it if you go to um uh Danum Veritatis, throw it, it it lists just all the types of er errors that the Pope can make in his ordinary magisterium, which includes in uh his prudential judgments. So in the ordinary magisterium, though it they can't get it hundred percent correct. It's not, it's, it's what it's saying is that these errors will not be actually heretical, which is you have to contradict, say, the doctrine of the, the Holy Trinity, you know, in the ordinary magisterium, though it's just not going to happen. Um, but does that mean that the Pope can't err in scientific facts through, like, say, I don't know what's it um about the modern crisis that wrote right. on global warming the, the church doesn't have the authority to say that oh these scientists are right through it's just it's, it's not in the, the positive faith therefore through the canard in that respect as well. right so there's all there's all kinds of errors that could be there but um it is that it, but it's protected there's so a it's, there's it's, a protection from a certain kind of mercy. yeah yeah yes. yeah right right it's not going to be heretical it's not going to be it's not yeah now now i know that there could be a distinction that somebody can make um where is the pope's ordinary magisterium protected mm -hmm. from uh being objectively heretical versus mm -hmm subjectively heretical on the part mm -hmm. of the assenters. So, for example, mm -hmm. um, somebody might say that the Pope might espouse um, a uh, something that is contradicting the dogma of the faith, but it mm -hmm. would not be injure, it would not be heresy for mm -hmm. the church to assent to it because we would be faultless because of how we're mm -hmm. at we're in a bind i i i think yeah. that your view is saying that it's objectively not going to be contradicting anything yeah. that a christian has to believe 
Yeah. Well, a, a pope can govern the church badly. Um, it's not, you know, it's in disciplines are separate from doctrines. Um, you know, so it's, you have to, again, there's all these different types of distinctions that you have to keep in mind, you know, that, um, you know, it's pope, but even through its Bellarmine would argue that even with the evil Pope, uh, God would rent the, the truth out of him when it comes to doctrine. But through it and the governance of the church, it's like the church's uh, laws through and disciplines are, are separate. Through it's not, through so you have to. Yeah. Uh, he, he follows up with another question. Don't know where, does that answer that question? That, I, he 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 came back with another question. I don't know if you see it there at the bottom. He says, "But couldn't the Pope err in that way in his extraordinary?" In other words, we're saying that in his ordinary magisterium, um, like like yeah, Donum, Verit Donum Veritas that says that there could be, you know. Mm -hmm. He he wants to know, couldn't the Pope err on scientific fact and well, in different ways, even in his ex cathedra? That. Yeah, in, even in his ex cathedra uh, modality. Yeah, yeah. Well, a, a pope can't like uh, define ex cathedra on quantum mechanics. Through so it, it's it's outside his purview. It's um, so right. Yeah, the, the pope can't. It's just outside the people of peace and authority. It's not. Yeah, it's not on faith and morals. So. Uh, let's see if we have any. Not that that would ever could ever be a thing. It would it would never come down to that. <clears throat> okay, yeah. So in my, you know, I had a I had a discussion with somebody the other day um, mm -hmm. over over this issue about the doctrine of the infallible safety, um, mm -hmm. where the Pope can't teach heresy in his mm -hmm. ordinary magisterium and mm -hmm. you know i i think that it, it's just another way of saying that there is papal infallibility um in the ordinary magisterium but it's mm -hmm. it's it's different because yeah, well, the, it's the, the, and the factability the it's not infallibility infallibility implies that it's a teaching is a reformable and is definitive so but and the factability means that just he, he, it's a base line that he cannot cross through. So it, infallibility implies a very high level of protection through uh, perfection and indefectibility that you can have all sorts of through meanderings from um, through, that still don't fall it will never stoop to that kind of level right. that'll actually be heretical. But so well, let's say um, let's say <laughs> let's say a pope in his ordinary magisterium, right, mm -hmm. wants to teach about the deity of Jesus Christ, mm -hmm. right? Well, he's going to be making statements about the deity of Jesus Christ, and mm -hmm. that are going to be binding through his ordinary magisterium, mm -hmm. and. Uh, if we say that he cannot contradict any of the dogmatic mm -hmm. content of the church's mm -hmm. dogmatic propositions, um, then mm -hmm. we are saying he's protected from erring in that regard. In that regard, yeah. So it's that's end the factability. It's not. It's not infallible. No, it's not. That well, what what does but, it, so my understanding of infallibility. You know, I understand that in ex cathedra and extraordinary mm -hmm. decrees of general councils, mm -hmm. that infallibility uh, does carry irreformability, and mm -hmm. it has that you know golden status. Mm -hmm. of, you know, yeah. but uh, infallibility at base simply means incapacitance for error, right? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. if if the pope is protected from heresy. In his ordinary magisterium, mm -hmm. then he is he is infallible to the degree that his in ordinary magisterium could not erroneously contradict dogmatic propositions or dogmatic content 
because mm -hmm. that would be an error to do so. But to say that he would he can teach infallibly in his ordinary magisterium, then it implies that everything that is in his ordinary magisterium is definitive and or reformable, to what's, which isn't the case. It's just it means that he he cannot stoop to heretical statements. And that's the way it was understood during the, the first millennium. It wasn't ever understood that the Pope was infallible through it in Acts Cathedral statements. It, they just understood that the, the Pope could never um, teach heresy. And through that, understand that the knew that if the major cases was brought to the Pope, then he would be able to when it came down to making a, a binary decision, then the binary decision would always be correct. So that's so it's like it's a baseline. It's not it's, it, it, you can't confuse that with infallibility because it's not like it's you, you can't allow for errors while um throw it. Well, let's so so for example, um mm -hmm. if we say that Jesus is not consubstantial with the father mm -hmm. that would be that would be a heretical statement mm -hmm. it's also an erroneous statement mm -hmm. and yeah. we say that the pope cannot teach that in his ordinary magisterium so that would yeah. be a species applied of infallibility mm -hmm. it, right? it, it erases from that yeah so it's it's, it's only when it's pushed to its furthest extreme that and the fact of ability and the fact of ability will actually it'll end up infallible so it's like if you can never like the fact from the faith in a certain capacity then when it comes to determining like a particular case then that particular case will be infallible though it's not that the, the Pope's always going to be infallible because that's just it's ridiculous. sure no, no yeah I don't I don't I don't think that the uh infallible safety theory which I I don't hold to it by the way um but I I don't think the infallible safety theory is is saying that the Pope is always infallible in his ordinary mm -hmm. magisterium um but it is saying that he's protected from yeah the, but that's where infallibility comes from. It's from that basic protection. Through that's it, it, it was always understood before, and this is where Dollinger last on to throw that before this is the way it was understood that just the, the, the Roman church had or that the apostolic see had never heard in faith, which is indefectibility. It's that it's it never had that kind of development until St. Thomas Aquinas. So it's St. Thomas Aquinas that it, it starts to. To be articulated that the Pope in certain cases can't be infallible. But before that, it was only just understood on this basic level of that this apostolic see of Rome had never defected from the faith. So it, it and then Brand Tyranny, um, he last on to that as well, and Hans Kung in order to dissent from uh uh Pope Paul the Sixth on um artificial you might be cool. so, yeah. yeah yeah um you know I, I i some of those distinctions are really hard to find in the first yeah. millennium but to me yeah. um you know some of the statements that are said about rome can go either way that the, that mm -hmm. the pope is always infallible when he teaches Mm -hmm. um he's protected from simply defecting from the faith these are like mm -hmm. big like we put these on two different pages today but mm -hmm. uh i don't it, it's very hard to prove that um you know some of the statements made even some of the magisterial statements that were made in the first millennium like during councils uh, that they had this distinction of infallibility but then a non-infallible safety and then a non-infallible protection against no, there was, infection. There was like, none of that. No. <laughs> it's like, it's like, you know what I'm saying? Like <laughs> these yeah. things are just, you know. Yeah. Um, so we've 
we've tried to articulate these things now mm -hmm. um but um mm -hmm. you know uh, but I, I i guess what i'm trying to get from you is that you know you obviously believe what vatican one says about the pope mm -hmm. not being able to err in his ex cathedra utterances um mm -hmm. but you would also say that he's infallible in his ordinary magisterium when he is teaching something that will embark upon the dogmatic content of faith mm. right because no, but because could, then it's infallibly it implies that this can't be ruined um sorry that it's a bad connection there sorry yeah, could no, you repeat that no i i said that um Sorry, yeah. I, I lost your connection. Just a, a, yeah. how about now? Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, so infallibility. Let, let me just run the train of thought. Mm -hmm. So infall infallibility means incapable of erring, mm -hmm. right? So, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, yeah. so yeah. if if a pope decides to teach about the deity of Jesus Christ, uh, when he teaches that, he's going to be teaching infallibly mm -hmm. because He's he's talking yeah. about the universal ordinary, you know. He he's teaching like what Vatican II talks about that universal ordinary magisterium, mm -hmm. you know. Like all the bishops, even when they're dispersed, mm -hmm. um, speak infallible, mm -hmm. you know. And so that would be a non-definitive well, yeah. modality, right? If the Pope always taught infallibly then you couldn't have any room for magisterial reversals though so everything would be and this is where Brian Tierney um he tried to say that uh the the origins of papal infallibility arose from uh Peter Olivet he wanted to try and assert that Peter Olivet was uh saying that the Pope's endorsement of the uh franciscan rule of the um w was infallible and always irreformable but that's the it's not the case through it so you have to have in the ordinary magisterium it has to like be able to be reformed in certain cases because you can't always apply the rule of infallibility across the board though there has to be like occasions in history where um yeah, yeah, I, I, I'm not. Yeah, I, I'm. I'm not saying that infallibility applies um, across the board. Um, but if Pope Francis got up tomorrow mm -hmm. and wrote an encyclical about the deity of Christ, mm -hmm. you know, ten paragraphs on the deity of Christ, do you think that he he is protected from error? Mm -hmm. And anything he writes, even if even if at the top he says, you know, he says, this is not an extraordinary exercise of mm -hmm. my magisterium. This is not an ex cathedra teaching. This is mm -hmm. part of my authentic, ordinary magisterium. And I'm mm -hmm. going to be talking about the dogmatic content of the deity of Christ. Mm -hmm. And he's going to go through what the deity of Christ it's consubstantiality with the Father, mm -hmm. with the Holy Spirit, the Blessed Trinity, all those things. Mm -hmm. You would say that there is nothing in that, nothing in the material of that mm -hmm. production oh, no. yeah, that, it, it, that it has the gift of infallibility. And perfectly formed, through, and that's why it's, through, you have to allow for development of doctrine and that kind of sense as well, through it's, because the, you're, you're saying it, you're talking, St. Thomas Aquinas would have only allowed absolute infallibility to God alone through so that you can have these imperfectly expressed expressions even in the extraordinary exercise of the um magisterium through you're not you, you don't have that kind of absolute infallibility that's it's only God has that alone through um but even but, in even in ex cathedra statements they're not absolute right you, no, you no not absolute through it's that and, and if you read through the uh, the Relatio, it, it says that it's, it's absolute infallibility be belongs to God alone through, but through the, <clears throat> there is various degrees of 
infallible. And the ordinary magisterium is much lower than the extraordinary magisterium throat. So you've got a, a higher degree throat. It's like when dogmas are infallibly put forth through a solemn definition or um, yeah. through a uh, throw the, the condemnation of a heresy, then that's a, a lot more precise because right. it, you're, you're breaking it down to small sentences. Throw and it, it's very hard to like right reform it. Yeah, yeah. So, but if through the ordinary magisterium, it's so immense. Through it, it, it can't possibly have that degree of um, infallibility. Through it's it, it's your there's degrees, and this is why. It's indefectibility is the basis of infallibility because then you have all these degrees that keep raising up until there's going to be a, a solemn definition. But through it, you can't have that without having a baseline. Sure. Yeah. yeah. Okay. <clears throat> um, I uh, I don't see any more questions coming in. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't know if you have any anything else to add. Um, no. Anything else to add to what you're, you know, can you tell us about anything you're writing in the future? Yeah. Uh, so I've got a, um, an article coming out, uh, in December on theological studies. And I'm trying to show in that how St. Robert Bellarmine's, um, opinion could have been raised to dogmatic status in pastor Turnus, um, because it, it, it's not exactly clear how that is done through it, it it's obviously not through the solemn definition of papal infallibility because that's that's dealing separate. with the ex cathedra yeah yeah, yeah. so it's I'm, I'm trying to show that it's it's more related to the first canon of pastor eternus which kind of like, yeah it's kind of yeah. like you're saying it's implied yeah yeah it's, it's not implied it's, it's it's very exact it's like it condemns the distinction between the the apostolic see and the individual holders of the apostolic seat and then condemning that the okay. that was the only distinction that the yeah. medieval canons had allowed and, for the and when, when can we ex when, so. when when can we expect that to be viewable to the or is yeah, it going to be in a be, journal first yeah so it'll be published in theological studies but it'll be open access um it's my research is it's funded by the Irish research Council, so um, it's all my research will be um, hopefully published uh, open access, so it'll be free, freely available. It, it, it's good to have that, so it's not hidden behind a, a paywall. And, right, so, right, yeah. Okay, all right. Well, um, I uh, think we'll end it here. It's get it's hour and forty minutes. <laughs> we we went, <laughs> went for a long time, but hey, yeah. Emmett um we'll we'll have to have you back on once your yeah, yeah, yeah. uh yeah. you're right your next article is out mm -hmm. and um and we'll do it that way so let's uh let me just uh find the uh, where, where can do you have a blog or anything that people can um yeah i have a, a blog it's uh i'm feeling the apocalypse so but it's uh but it's i haven't been blogging in a way that um so it's it's kind of, uh, uh, I'm just focusing on the PhD, PhD okay. studies just at the moment. Yeah, so. And uh, if somebody wants to reach you out for a theological question, sh sh uh, reach, reach, to, reach, uh, if they want to reach out to you to ask a theological question, can they find you on Facebook? Um, yeah, Facebook. Yeah. So if the, if you just send a friend request or a message through Facebook, yeah. it's probably yeah. the best way. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I'm not trying to get people, strangers, to go, you know, spam your private message. You know. <laughs> um, okay. So I'm going to end the broadcast here, okay. and uh, and then uh, I'll I'll talk to you when when we get in the backstage. God bless yeah. everybody. If you like the video, uh, share it and uh, ask questions in the comments. I'm sure Emmett can revisit and look at the comments to see if there's any questions that anybody has. So God bless you all. We'll see you next time. Oh,